All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Stephanie Karos, and I am the Senior Endangered Species Policy Specialist with the Center's Government Affairs Program. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. We have some amazing speakers lined up for you. Uh, and this is a very special webinar because not only are we celebrating Earth Day, we're also celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act. For five decades now, the Endangered Species Act has saved some of our most iconic animals and plants from extinction, and tonight we'll be hearing about some of those success stories. Uh, but before we get started, I'd just like to flag a couple of things. So first, the chat function has been turned off because we've gotten feedback that it can be distracting during the presentations, uh, but don't worry, we'll have some time at the end for you all to ask our panelists some questions. Uh, you should see a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, and that is where you can type in your questions, and you can type those in throughout the presentation tonight. Uh, second, this will be recorded and will be available on our website tomorrow morning. And then lastly, many of the recovery stories we'll hear about tonight will also be featured in an upcoming center report called A Promise to the Wild. And we will be releasing that the first week of May. So be on the lookout for that. And then at the end of this webinar, we'll also be sharing an action that you all can take right now to help endangered species. Um, okay, let's jump right into it. We have five great speakers tonight. And just to be mindful of time, I'm actually going to ask that our panelists wait to introduce themselves until it is their time to speak. Um, so with that being said, I'll turn it over to our fierce leader, Kieran Suckling, to kick us off. Oh, Kieran, you're on mute. <clears throat> of course, I was on mute. Um, so as Stephanie said, I'm Kieran Suckling, the executive director and one of the founders of the Center for Biological Diversity. So I'm talking today from Tucson, Arizona. Um, so the Endangered Species Act, you know, it's really the most important and most powerful environmental law that's been created uh, in the U.S. In fact, I think it's uh, the most powerful environmental law in the world. And it has um, been a model. It's the first Endangered Species Act of any nation in the world. And it's become a model since then um, for other Endangered Species Acts uh, around the globe because it's been so successful. And, and part of the reason why it's been so successful is that it just has this laser focus on preventing extinction and recovering species and also requiring that all decisions be solely made on the best available science. And that's that's considerably different uh, than the structure of a lot of other environmental organs, which are also important, um, but don't have the kind of really black and white clear standards of uh, the Endangered Species Act. Now, it's 50th anniversary, so it was signed in 73. And a lot of folks know that it was signed uh, famously by, by Richard Nixon, not someone to think of as a great environmentalist. But um, even more important than that, because uh, that was a done deal by that time, Richard Nixon actually called on Congress before that to create an Endangered Species Act that, that he could sign because there, there were precursors, there were um, forerunners in the Endangered Species Act in 1967, 1969, and they were clearly inadequate um, to save species. They were based on sort of an old school idea that what was really killing species was the direct killing of them and not so much habitat loss and other things. And so Nixon, uh, you know, his aides explained to him, called on Congress and said, look, bring me a modern endangered species protection law and I'll sign it, one that deals with habitat protection, most importantly, uh, and one with real teeth. And, uh, and that's what happened. And he signed that law in December of 73. And so since then, it has really been remarkably effective. 99% uh, of all the species that have been added to the endangered species list have been saved. From, protect, from extinction, which is pretty remarkable. 
Um, and 85% of all those species have increased or remained stable since they were put on to the endangered species list. So they're all uh, moving in the right direction to be um, eventually recovered and not needing this intense level of protective work. So the center was created in 1989. Um, our very first actions were under the Endangered Species Act to protect the Mexican spotted owl and to get the Mexican gray wolf introduced into the wild. At that time, it only occurred in captivity. The Reagan administration um, had declared it to be unrecoverable. Um, and it required us to sue to, to move that forward. And we were able to do so because the Endangered Species Act is so powerful, so well-written, it was such a great tool. And so since then, to this day, the Endangered Species Act has been uh, the center's go-to uh, tool for biodiversity protection. Um, but, you know, it's not really a matter of, of the center just using you know, a ready-made law that was there for us. Uh, we had to first revive critical provisions of the law that had long been ignored by the feds and were not really being used by other environmentalists at that time and we were doing other kinds of things. Uh, you know, the, the listing program, you know, putting the species onto the list uh, had, had slowed way down. Uh, it was radically and, um, poorly structured, uh, not working well, the provision to um, protect critical habitat areas for species had in fact been abandoned completely by the Reagan administration. Um, so we had to go in and revive these portions of the law as it, as it was then in 89. Um, and then we had to win far reaching legal precedents which expanded um, and clarified the power and, and reach of the law. So when you're sitting here today, you know, and everyone looks at, you know, the ESA and, and, and what it does, uh, it's important to realize that um, that changed over time. And much of what we look at today and take for granted uh, about the Endangered Species Act is actually a combination of the law and 30 years of the center focusing intensely its energy on this law. Um, and making it work uh, and expanding it in ways that other people could use. And I feel like that's certainly one of the um, things I'm most proud about um, in, in the center's history. In fact, I was just at this um, very large uh, environmental law conference uh, a few months ago. It's the biggest environmental law conference in the country, many hundreds of people there. And I was walking down a hallway to go to a panel and I passed a whole bunch of panels on the way. And as I looked in the window of each room, three rooms in a row, there's a, someone had a slide up that said, Center for Biological Diversity, the Fish and Wildlife Service. And in every one of those rooms, someone was talking about some, some lawsuit that, uh, that we had won and that was now creating opportunities uh, for other people to use, use as well. So that's certainly been one of our most important legacies. Uh, to date, we've protected over 800 species under the Endangered Species Act uh, through scientific petitions and to litigation and some uh, smart uh, legal settlements. And we've won the protection of over 500 million acres of land and water as critical habitat for endangered species. These are areas that are specifically mapped out um, and given habitat protection for, for endangered species. And through utilizing the law to protect species, often groups of many groups of species at a time, We've, uh, you know, achieved really a complete overhaul of ecosystem protection from, from the Southwest here where I am to California, Florida, the Northwest, rivers across the Midwest, Alaska, uh, big chunks of the Southeast, and um, even Puerto Rico. 
So the Endangered Species Act, while it's it's focused on uh, species, um, it really is also uh, our best tool uh, for having ecosystem protection. In fact, in fact, in many ways, our only tool for for doing that. It's quite an extraordinary um, law. So we're gonna move on here in a moment to have uh, other. Um, staff at the center talk about more specific work uh, that can be done. But I do want to uh, ask you for a favor before then, which is that um, if you support this work, if you think it's really important, uh, I'd like to ask you to make a financial contribution so we can keep doing this uh, because we're only able to do all this work uh, stay in business for these years and, and get all this stuff done because of the support of our our members. They provide over seventy five percent of our total income, um, and that's what keeps it going. And that's what keeps all these uh, species behind me um, alive doing our work. So, is Stephanie or someone able to? send out that link to that fundraising page yes that is in the chat now right right on well um well thank you very much and with that who comes next great thanks kiran um now we are going to hear our first success story and so i will turn it over to Catherine. hi everyone i'm Catherine kilda and i'm a senior attorney in the oceans program and I'm gonna share my screen so I can talk about humpback whales. Um, when Karan was speaking about the Endangered Species Act being remarkably effective, humpback whales are a great example of that. They were decimated by whaling, commercial whaling, um, almost right up until they were protected under the Endangered Species Act as a worldwide endangered population. Uh, you can see the increase on the West Coast alone. Uh, in total in the North Pacific in 2010, there were over 22,000 and a large portion of those are Hawaiian humpbacks um, that live at the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary. Some of those Hawaiian whales migrate to the West Coast, primarily off California and Oregon, the humpback whales winter in Central America or Mexico. So one of the problems, but also one of the remarkable things about these animals is that they travel hundreds of miles for these migrations and they come to the West Coast because it's nutrient rich, cold waters with lots of food and they congregate there in the summer. And you can see the long fins on these humpbacks. They're very surface active, which means they're a favorite of whale watchers. Um, this is relevant to science too, because whale watchers can take pictures and then identify these whales at its individual level. And so collaborating with scientists in Central America and Mexico, they can identify which whales that come to the West Coast also go to these separate populations. So they were able to divide the worldwide population into genetically um, distinct populations. These are labeled by number. Number five is the Mexico population. Six is the endangered Central America population. Four is the Hawaii population. And in 2021, the center successfully litigated and got final critical habitat. You can see this is for the Central America population and includes most of the West Coast. Unfortunately, there are still threats. The primary threats on the West Coast are fishing gear and vessel strikes. Um, you can see the whale in the picture on the bottom right. This was Fran. She was one of the most popular humpback whales and she was killed by a ship um, and washed up on Half Moon Bay. But luckily, just in the past month, her calf that was with her when she was struck by a ship came, went to Mexico over the winter and came back and was seen in Monterey Bay. Um, Fran was 
17 years old when she died, but they live to 45 or 50 years typically. And her calf that's now a year and a half is already 30 to 35 feet and 12 to 15 tons. Luckily, we're having success litigating to reduce these threats. Um, we had a win for fishing gear um, last, but recently in March where we sued the government because the sable fish pot fishery, which uses very heavy metal pots sitting at the bottom of the ocean off the West Coast, connected to a line that goes to a buoy so the fishermen can re retrieve the pot. Um, unfortunately, that entangles humpback whales on those long flippers that you saw in the first slide. And the federal government operates this fishery by issuing permits and opening and closing the season and putting in um, fisheries management measures. And they were issuing permits to take endangered and threatened humpback whales, but they don't have any measures to minimize or reduce the take or the harm and the injury to those whales. And when the whales are wrapped up in the fishing line, they drag the pots behind them or they drown underwater. And that's especially sad when these animals are found in other countries like Canada or Mexico with US commercial fishing gear on them. So the judge fortunately found for us, even though the government said we don't have money to convene take reduction teams and come up with a take reduction plan, um, the judge said you can't indefinitely delay the mitigation measures while you're issuing permits for endangered and threatened marine mammals. We also had a win on the shipping front. This was in December and we had challenged the Coast Guard's biological opinion. The Coast Guard sets shipping lanes off in the whole country, but we specifically challenged your shipping lanes um, in the Santa Barbara Channel and off San Francisco. Um, when the Coast Guard set those shipping lanes, they had to consult under the Endangered Species Act. And they said, actually, these shipping lanes help the whales because in a no lane hypothetical scenario, the ships would be all over the place. And then the whales would be more susceptible to getting hit. And so are setting the shipping lanes, even when they're going through these whale feeding hotspots, um, has no impact. It just has a beneficial impact. And the judge didn't buy that. They said, the judge said that this isn't compliant with the Endangered Species Act. Um, and the government has to go back and redo their biological opinion and implement mitigation measures and assess the actual impact of shipping on these whales. So even though it's very sad with the increase in all these whales and the high anthro, um, anthropogenic effects to the whales, because there's more whales, they're more susceptible to human um, caused death. And there's a lot of good success stories because of the Endangered Species Act. And I'll turn it back over to Stephanie. Great, thanks, Catherine. Um, okay, so now it's time to hear about an animal I know many of you care about. Uh, Amaruk, take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Amaruk Weiss. I am the center's senior wolf advocate. The first wolves came from Asia to North America up to 700,000 years ago. They arrived by crossing the frozen Bering Strait land bridge, which connected the two continents. And then their powerful drive to seek mates and territories of their own propelled them, one wolf after another after another, across the continent, two million wolves across North America. 20,000 to 130,000 years ago, the first people came, and some arrived by crossing that same land bridge, others arrived here by boat landing on the shores, and they too dispersed across the land, and they built powerful cultures and lived for tens of thousands of years with wolves and other wildlife. And 400 years ago, just 400 years ago, the next wave of people came from Europe. And in only 400 years of time, 
They killed hundreds of thousands, millions, the first people. They killed tons of millions, the wildlife, bison, passenger pigeons, grizzlies, bald eagles, wolves. By the early 1900s, what was now known as the lower 48 United States, there were almost no wolves left. By the 1960s and 70s, cultural attitudes and values in this country had shifted, which allowed for the passage of this profound law, the Endangered Species Act. And many of the same destructive forces still existed, but now this law made it possible to fight back on behalf of nature, on behalf of wolves. This law makes all the difference in the world. It is our wall to hold back the destructive forces it is, as Kiran said, our tool to protect animals and special places across the land. The essence of this law is that every wolf, each and every wolf, possesses the majesty and grandeur and beauty of life on this planet. I'm going to share my screen. Two of the very first species protected under the act were the gray wolf and the red wolf. The gray wolf, Canis lupus, once ranged across the entire northern hemisphere of the planet, including nearly all of North America and nearly the entire lower 48 United States. We're not switching slides. Let's try that again. Hmm. You may have to do this one slide at a time. There we go. That's the beauty. The red wolf, Canis rufus. This animal is endemic to the US. And what that means is it exists nowhere else on the planet. And this species once ranged across the East Coast, through the Southeast, and all the way west into Texas. Yay. This map tells the story in one glorious picture, but let me walk you through it. So on this map, everywhere that's dark brown is where the gray wolf historically lived. And everywhere that's bright salmon pink was historic red wolf habitat. And then that area that's kind of pinkish brown, that was likely an area of species overlap. By 1974, when these two species were given Endangered Species Act protections, only remnant populations of each of these wolves still existed. The sole existing population of gray wolves in the lower 48 was about 600 wolves in that tiny little yellow spot up there in far northeastern Minnesota, plus on Isle Royale and Lake Superior, and that lake just off to the right. The sole existing population of red wolves lived in that red and white crosshatch area near the bottom of the map in Texas and Louisiana. 50 years later, because of the Endangered Species Act and the recovery planning that was required by the act for all listed species, gray wolves now occupy all of the areas that are marked in green, and red wolves now are being restored in that part of the East Coast that you see in red. There are a million milestones to celebrate in the ongoing recovery of wolves in the US thanks to the Endangered Species Act, but since our time today is brief, I'm just going to describe a few of them. For the red wolf, the Endangered Species Act allowed, required, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to preserve the few remaining wolves and from only 14 founding animals start a captive breeding program and reintroduce red wolves back into the wild. And now groups like the Center and our allies are using the power of the Endangered Species Act to keep legal pressure on the service to reintroduce more red wolves elsewhere. For the gray wolf, in the Western Great Lakes states, the Act's protections allowed Minnesota's wolf population to grow in number and expand to neighboring states. And today, in the combined Western Great Lakes region of Isle Royale, Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin, there are around 4,300 wolves. In the Southwest, Thanks to the center litigation, some of which Kiran mentioned, in 1990, and then in 2015, and multiple other times, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was forced to develop and later improve a long overdue recovery plan and a reintroduction plan 
for the Mexican gray wolf, the rarest of the rare. And today, 241 Mexican gray wolves range in Arizona and New Mexico across four national forests. In Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, wolves were restored here in the mid-1990s by capturing wolves in Canada and then reintroducing them to the Northern Rockies. Today, this region has up to 2,800 wolves. And renewed wolf presence here is restoring key ecological processes and relationships between predators and prey and the landscapes they share. And since the intent of the Endangered Species Act is to protect and conserve not just imperiled species, but also the ecosystems on which they depend, having wolves back allows the tapestry of wild nature to be woven whole again. On the West Coast, the Endangered Species Act has allowed us all to witness the miracle of wolves returning on their own to places a species once called home. There are now around 400 wolves in Washington, Oregon, and California combined. This was made possible by repeated litigation by the center and allies to keep Endangered Species Act protections in place so that these dispersing wolves could make their inspiring and sometimes really breathtaking journeys. There is now one known wolf pack in Colorado and plans to get more wolves there through a reintroduction program between the state and federal agencies. Today, there are more than 7,000 wolves in the lower 48. And while this is a fraction of the species historic numbers, and we will never stop fighting to ensure that there are more wolves in more places, this is a tenfold increase of what the population was when wolves were listed for protection in 1974. This increase has happened because of the Endangered Species Act and because all of you are here fighting alongside us to protect the act and to protect wolves. Thanks. Thank you, Amaruk. That is one of my favorite wolf pictures of all time, I must say. <laughs> oh, kitties. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Noah, who will talk about how the Endangered Species Act not only protects wildlife and plants, but also the ecosystems that they depend on. Hi, everybody. I'm Noah Greenwald. I'm the Endangered Species Director here at the Center for Biological Diversity. I'm going to share my screen quickly. And as Kiran mentioned, you know, the Endangered Species Act is really our only tool for protecting ecosystems. And um, perhaps one of the best examples of that is the Northwest Forest Plan uh, here in the Pacific Northwest where I live in, in I live in Portland. And um, the protection of the Northern Spotted Owl uh, in the late 80s, you know, at, at that time um, under the Reagan administration and then the Bush administration, we were largely liquidating the last remaining old growth forests in Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, just incredibly high rates of logging and, and our old growth forests were disappearing down to, down to roughly 10%. Uh, the protection of the Northern Spotted Owl and then the protection of the marbled Merlet in 1992. And then um, some lawsuits that were brought um, by some allies of ours um, resulted in that logging largely coming to a halt. And then in 1994, the Clinton administration coming up with the Northwest Forest Plan, which was designed not to just protect those um, couple species, uh, but to protect hundreds of species that depend on old growth forests and um, ended up protecting you know, roughly an area of 25 million acres. So just fundamentally changed how we were managing those public lands in the Pacific Northwest. Many people don't realize that much of our national wildlife refuge system was established to protect endangered species. And um, as part of the 50th anniversary, Stephanie and others you know, looked into this and identified all the national wildlife refuges that were specifically created to protect endangered species and found that there were a total of 83 national wildlife refuges that were protected for endangered species covering more than 21 million acres. 
you know, from the from the National Key Deer Wildlife Refuge in Florida to the Mortensen Lake Wildlife Refuge in Wyoming that uh, has the only population of Wyoming toad in the world to um, Hakalau National Wildlife Refuge on the Big Island in Hawaii, which is one of the ones that I've been fortunate to visit and protect. Um, this cute little bird, the Hawaii Akepa, uh, it's one of the only, one of only two places that this small orange bird occurs. Um, it protects other, you know, highly, highly endangered forest birds on Hawaii. Some of the best ohia forest left, uh, endangered plants, endangered insects. So, you know, these National Wildlife Refuges protect some of the most special places in America and were, were created specifically because of the Endangered Species Act. Hey, Noah. I yeah. don't mean to interrupt, but um, if if you're sharing, we can't see your screen. Oh, you can't? Oh, no. no. Oh, I might have for Gosh, I'm... <laughs> That's terrible. I want to um, see the bird you're talking about. Okay, just a sec. That's <laughs> embarrassing. Um, okay, I am sorry. Well, I will show you the other slides then as well. That's really unfortunate. Um, I forgot a key part of the whole thing, which is pushing the button. Um, Okay, how about that? Yes, good. Okay, so that's the Northwest Forest Plan area. As you can see, it's quite extensive and protects some really great areas, some of my favorites. These are our 83 National Wildlife Refuges that were protected um, specifically for endangered species. Um, and then you can see, oops, why did it go backwards? Um, you can see Hakalau, down there on the big island. And then this is, here's the bird that I was talking about, which I was fortunate to see. It's a, a very orange, almost creamsicle colored bird and uh, very teeny, you can't quite get the scale here, but it's, it's quite a little bird. One of the cuter birds around really. And then, you know, you know, it's not just the Northwest Forest Plan area that we've seen this protection of ecosystems. This map shows what were once the extensive longleaf pine forests of the Southeast, um, which covered hundreds of millions of acres and have largely been lost to urbanization, to um, conversion to pine plantations that aren't longleaf pine. But we've, start, we've started to see that turned around and in particular for a species called the red cockaded woodpecker, but also gopher tortoises and many other species and um, it's a good example of, you know, just fundamentally changing our relationship to the natural world instead of, you know, treating the natural world as somewhere that we just convert to our own uses. The longleaf pine ecosystem and red cockaded woodpecker is one where we've had to start to re return natural processes in order to maintain that ecosystem. And fire in particular was a, a key part of longleaf pine and something that was lost from the ecosystem and that we're starting to bring back. And, you know, that's largely because of the Endangered Species Act. You know, our whole kind of view, our, our ecological view of the world and, and something that many of us have started to adopt and think about is, you know, largely because of the Endangered Species Act. Um, you know, and I, I could go on and mention other examples. Karan mentioned the Mexican spotted owl. You know, we um, protected uh, millions of acres in the Southwest forests for the Mexican spotted owl. Um, the sagebrush ecosystem, it's an, it's an ongoing um, battle, but, you know, for the, for the sage grouse, we're working to protect that ecosystem. And, you know, this, this is really, the Endangered Species Act that's fundamentally changed our relationship to the natural world. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Sorry about forgetting the picture. No worries. Thanks, <laughs> Noah. Um, okay, so now for our last panelist of the night, I will pass it to Lorianne. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Lorianne Bird, and I'm the Center's Environmental Health Director, and I'm here to talk to you about the Fender's Blue Butterfly. Um, the Fender's Blue Butterfly is a beautiful small butterfly. Its wingspan is about one inch. 
The males have an iridescent blue upper side on their wings, and females have rusty brown wings. The wings of both have a black border with a pretty white fringe, and it is endemic to the prairie and oak savannas of Oregon's Willamette Valley. The Fender's blue was first described in 1931, and by 1937, um, it, it was never seen again after 1937 until almost 50 years later. So it once thrived in the prairies of Oregon's Willamette Valley, but during the past 140 years, about 99% of the native prairies in the valley were converted to uh, agriculture or otherwise developed into roads or housing. Um, incredibly, in 1988, a 12-year-old boy out with his butterfly net caught a few of these butterflies and his finds were confirmed by an entomology professor a year later in 1989. And by 2000, the Fender's blue butterfly was protected under the Endangered Species Act. The Fender's blue butterfly is a really interesting butterfly for a lot of reasons, and I could talk about it all day, but I won't. Um, but its entire life cycle is intertwined with its primary host plant, the Kincaid's lupin, which is also endemic to the Willamette Valley. And the two were actually put on the endangered species list at the same time in the same action by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. They're a great example of how the ESA has worked to save both a pollinator and its plant from extinction. Both were critically imperiled at the time of their listing. When the Kincaid's lupin opens its bright purple flowers in late spring, the Fender's blue butterflies start emerging from their chrysalises, hidden in their towering plants. A few weeks later, the females will go back to lay their eggs on the undersides of the Kincaid lupin's leaves, and the cycle begins anew. At the time that this species, these species were protected, there were just 3,391 of these little butterflies left in the wild. Three years after the, they were protected under the Endangered Species Act, conservation groups had to sue the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, to get critical habitat set aside. And since then, 3,000 acres of critical habitat have been protected for this butterfly. And a tremendous amount of work has gone into restoring this prairie habitat. One important thing that happened in the course of um, this protection was that scientists consulted with local tribes particularly the Kalapuya, who had lived and continue to live in their ancestral lands in the Willamette Valley. From them, they learned that control burns were essential to maintaining these prairies and their inhabitants. Thanks to a lot of hard work and the protection that the Endangered Species Act provided, Defenders Blue and its beloved Kincaid Lupin have been able to thrive. In 2016, they, the Defenders Blue reached its all-time uh, high of 29,000. Just recently, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced that it was downlisting the Fender's blue butterfly from endangered to threatened because it is continuing to recover thanks to the protections it's received. This is an exciting step for this little butterfly, but it still faces threats, especially pesticides and climate chaos, so it couldn't be declared all the way recovered. However, its core habitat is safe from development and it's in a much better place than it was even just two decades ago. Today, you can find the Fender's Blue Butterfly in 32 sites covering 408 acres in the Willamette Valley. And it is protected permanently until it is recovered in each of those sites, even as development continues in the Willamette Valley. So that's the story. Thanks, Lorianne. Okay, so I think that brings us to our question and answer session um, that concludes our formal presentation. So let's just open it up to some questions for our panelists. Let's see. Okay, so our first question is, is there any particular species that has been on the endangered species list for the longest time? If so, what is it and for how long? Yeah, I could answer that one. Uh, it's not just a single species when the precursor to Endangered Species Act was created in 1967. Um, a whole bunch of species were put on there. And then when the Endangered Species Act, modern one came in 73, they were incorporated over. So 
There is a group of about 90 uh, species that were listed there in 1967. Um, none of them were plants or invertebrates because the law did not allow that back then. Um, and most are birds and mammals um, because uh, back then there tended to be kind of a, a unscientific prioritizing of, of birds and mammals. The, the law of today is much more I shouldn't say that the law wasn't biased, but the way it was implemented was. And I think one of the important things the center has uh, achieved uh, through our work in fish and species listings is, is to have gotten it to be much more scientific and taxonomically balanced uh, than it was back then. So what species were on the list back then? Uh, the American bald eagle, uh, was one of the very early species on there. The American alligator was on there. Uh, there were a slew of endangered Hawaiian songbirds uh, because we recognized they were so endangered early on. Uh, Kirkland's warbler, a uh, bird that since recovered very well and come off the list um, has uh, been on there. Um, and a number of whale species. Awesome, great. Okay, this is a good one. Is the Endangered Species Act effective in protecting species and habitat on private land? I can answer that one. Um, it is, um, but it is not as effective on, on federal land because you know, the laws on federal land are stricter, um, but also from a compliance point of view, um, the federal government is more likely to enforce the law more strictly on its own lands than on, on private lands. The agency is, is very concerned about uh, political backlash. So, but nonetheless, um, it has, and, and primarily because uh, one portion of the act forbids killing or harming of an endangered species anywhere, including private land, uh, unless one gets a permit for, for doing so. And these permits on private land are, you know, are often called habitat conservation plans. And so what, and historically, they were kind of done one parcel uh, of land at a time. Uh, which is extremely time consuming and difficult to go. Um, but due to environmentalists pushing whole suites of species to be endangered in, in, in bioregions like you know, the Southwest and Southern California and so forth, um, this trend has started where local governments, usually counties, will essentially take responsibility for um, this legal need to get a permit and will then through the federal government set uh, uh, limits on development. So we've seen these very large multi-species habitat conservation plans that are really aimed at managing development around particular urban areas. So uh, there's a big one around San Diego, a uh, big round around Los Angeles and interior California, another um, around here in Tucson. And those have been uh, remarkably effective. Um, local governments had fought to um, create effective zoning and you know, smart growth kind of things for decades and, and kept getting losing because the political power of the developers uh, then they suddenly had this big federal hook to say, look, we're, we're now we're going to have uh, some kind of smart land use planning and it's going to be based around um, endangered species because that's what the law requires. So uh, then and then other than that, on smaller, more individual parcels, uh, a lot of money passes through the federal government to private landowners to um, take care of species on their private land as well. So, so it does have a good record there, although, as I said, not as good and sometimes controversial, but 
it's very important. Great, thanks, Kiran. And someone wants to know what critter is on your hat and can you put it up closer to the camera? <laughs> uh, this, all right, I will put it close, to, uh, warning. It's, um, did that come out there? Yes, well, there you go. Uh, that is the American pika, a species we've been trying to get listed uh, as endangered uh, for years now, so far not successfully. Uh, but we're continuing to push on that. It's one of many species being driven by global warming. And I think one of the really important contributions of the center historically to species conservation is um, getting the very first uh, species listed as endangered due to climate change, um, because none were before we started. Uh, and then weaning legal precedents to say that climate change is something that should be regulated needs to be regulated under the Endangered Species Act, because before that time, a kind of narrow view was taken that, well, it doesn't say climate change in the law, it must not count. Uh, and we were able to overcome that. Awesome, that actually leads perfectly into this next question, which is how are you focusing on interactions of the Endangered Species Act and species challenges as the climate changes? And are there any specific examples where on what we're currently working on. No, you want to take that on? It's like I'm talking a lot. Sure. Yeah, there's a number of species that we've been tracking and that are severely threatened by climate change. Um, one that I've worked on recently is the is the Mount Rainier white-tailed ptarmigan, which is a grouse-like bird that lives in Washington State in the Cascades on Mount Rainier and in the North Cascades. And um, it, you know, as our climate warms, it's getting pushed off the top of the mountains. It, it can live in these wintry areas, you know, on Mount Rainier um, by essentially burying itself in the snow. And um, as we get more rain and snow events, it, it's less able to bury itself in the snow. And so, I mean, I, I think we're going to be faced with those kind of situations more and more as the climate changes, you know, just the environments that species are adapted to are changing. And um, there's not always going to be any place for them to go. And I think, you know, one of the key roles of the Endangered Species Act in that fight to reduce our emissions and to address climate change is just highlighting that there's a lot to lose. You know, we're going to lose a lot of the magic of the world if we don't get a handle on this, including the white-tailed ptarmigan and on Mount Rainier and the polar bear and corals and so many other species. And so that's something we're working very diligently to address and and are deeply concerned about. Thanks, Noah. Um, let's see. Is the center working on ending the military sound testing? We are. This is a big issue. So um, the, the military, it's not just testing. Um, um, the military communicates uh, with very loud sonar in the oceans. Um, the sonar can travel enormous distances um, across the ocean. Um, and these sounds are extremely loud to marine mammals. Um, and it can, some of them, it will kill the mammal. The sound is so loud. Uh, for others, it doesn't kill them, but it can really disrupt their ability to speak to each other because they're also using uh, sounds in this range. Um, to talk and also across very, very long distances. You know, animals cannot see each other very well in the ocean. And so they need to be able to talk to, to find each other. And so the military, of course, US military is, is a huge source of the sound, but, but there's others, um, oil and gas companies will also use very loud sonar sounds to search for uh, oil. Uh, under the uh, ground in the ocean. So we have, we and NRDC as a partner 
have filed uh, several lawsuits against the Department of Defense. Um, not to completely stop these, because that's just not in our power. Uh, it's not what the law would say. Uh, but to minimize their impact on endangered species by not sending out uh, as loud of sounds, not sending out as many of sounds. And, um, and then also um, having observers um, to look for um, marine mammals before they do this at all, and if they're present to not, not do it. So um, it has been a, a big issue for us. Great. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So let's see. This might be a question for Amaruk. So in some carnivore conservation efforts, there has been more success with positive rewards for carnivore coexistence than with punitive results from conflict. Can the center say anything about what is being done or explored in this area? Sure, I can give you some good examples of what's happening in California right now. Uh, wolves started returning to California in 2011. We got our first pack in 2015. And starting in the last few years, we now have three confirmed packs and probably another pack that's forming. And we've started to have some livestock conflicts develop in northeastern California. Uh, a lot of it has to do with, as you can imagine, livestock producers who are used to ranching uh, for decades, decades and decades without wolves and not being aware that they need to change some of their practices. And of course, this isn't to say that uh, every wolf that runs across livestock is going to get into trouble. That's certainly not the case. Plenty of researchers will tell you that wolves will walk right through a pasture full of livestock and keep on going. But uh, difficulties can arise if the livestock are particularly vulnerable. And that may mean that the livestock owners have left their animals out on the range while they are sick or diseased or injured, which attracts in all kinds of carnivores, not just wolves. And so in a situation like this with newly uh, returning wolves, it's really important to help get some of the tools on the ground to help people learn how to change their business practices, because that's what livestock production is, it's a business. And when circumstances change, you change with the times. And uh, whoever asked the question is right. Having a combination of both incentive and requirements are really, really important. So in California, we've been part of a stakeholder process for the agency to develop a three-pronged program that was recently funded by the legislature to be able to pay livestock producers direct compensation for direct losses that are confirmed or probable wolf cause losses after investigations have been completed, to also help provide financial assistance for them to implement non-lethal proactive measures to prevent those conflicts before they ever start. For instance, keeping your calving and, and uh, lambing situations in pens at nights or having these flashing lights called flex box lights out on the um, fence lines at night, which make uh, predators think that there's somebody walking around with flashlights. So that, that prong is also part of the program. The third one is something interesting that has only been tried elsewhere in the country in the Mexican wolf range, and that's called pay for presence. And that is where you literally give payments to livestock owners, recognizing that you have identified that they have wolves coming through their land, but they're only going to get those payments if they use non-lethal conflict deterrence measures to prevent conflicts from occurring to begin with. You don't get paid just because there's wolves on your land, you will get paid for your efforts of coexisting with wolves, but you will also get financial assistance to put those coexistence measures in place. And so uh, this is a first time deal for California. We're going to see how it's going. Uh, initially, uh, the livestock producers uh, that were part of the stakeholder group wanted uh, pretty extensive uh, things uh, compensated for, but there's a best in the environmental community found that science just doesn't support. So uh, we've helped shape that program a little bit more to our liking and uh, keep posted and we'll be able to tell you how that goes. Awesome. Thanks, Amaruk. And okay, one more question because I know everybody loves monarchs. How are monarchs doing and what can folks on the webinar do to help? I'm going to let Lorianne take that question. Um, well, maybe I'll put the second half of the answer over to you, Stephanie, and we can talk about the 
policy initiatives. Um, but um, monarchs are not doing well. Um, both the Western population um, and the migratory population that travels from uh, Mexico to Canada and back each year are both doing badly this year. They're at about 85% decline. Um, and those numbers fluctuate each year, of course, as insect populations fluctuate more than mammals, for example. Um, they're doing, their key threats are um, deforestation in Mexico and climate change and um, pesticides in the United States. So one of the big things that happens is as they're traveling through the US, they are either hit directly with pesticides as they travel through agricultural lands or they find no food because glyphosate, the most popular uh, pesticide in the world is very heavily used in the US and we have about 330 million pounds of it deployed on agricultural lands in the US every year. And it's especially good at killing milkweed, um, which is the monarch butterfly's sole host plant. So if you want to protect monarch butterflies, you can plant native milkweed in your garden. Please don't plant non-native milkweed because it confuses monarch butterflies and they don't know when to migrate and they um, spread disease and stay in one place for too long. So please plant milkweed, plant native milkweed, um, and plant lots of it. Um, it should grow like a weed, but sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult to establish. And the other thing you can do is um, buy organic food. And um, that obviously means that the food is grown without the use of glyphosate um, and means the more acres are safe for monarchs um, to travel through. Monarchs should get a ESA listing decision in 2024, which is very exciting. We petitioned for them I think, a decade ago. Um, and so we'll see if they get the Protection of the Endangered Species Act and what that will look like. And with that, I'll hand it over to Stephanie, who does a lot of policy work on monarchs. Yeah, so on the policy front, we're always trying to get more money for monarchs. For the last few years, we've advocated to um, for $100 million per year for, for uh, monarchs nationwide. Um, and in particularly uh, for Western monarchs, um, we've worked with members of Congress in both the House and the Senate to introduce the Monarch Act, which would provide $25 million a year for Western monarchs. Half of that would go towards creating a grant program for on the ground conservation, and the other half would go towards implementing an existing Western monarch butterfly conservation plan. Um, so all of that and more is on our website if you want more information on that, or you can just email me. But um, looking at the time, we do need to wrap up. So I just wanna thank all of our panelists tonight. Um, we've heard some amazing comeback stories and it really is such an incredible testament to how successful the Endangered Species Act has been and continues to be. Um, I hope everyone watching this is inspired to take action to help fight the extinction crisis. Uh, this work is far from over. We still face the possibility of losing 1 million species in the coming decades. Um, but, you know, as we've heard tonight, the Endangered Species Act still shows the best path forward for the next 50 years and beyond. Um, so speaking of taking action, let me just share this real quick. Here we go. Um, I'm sharing an action alert here, and we will also be sending out an email tomorrow where you can urge your member, uh, your members of Congress to significantly increase funding for endangered species recovery. Uh, the Endangered Species Act has been underfunded for decades. Hundreds of endangered species receive less than $1,000 a year for their recovery, and many actually don't receive any funding at all. So this action would specifically ask that Congress pass the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which in addition to providing states the much needed funding they need to conserve their at-risk species, it also provides $112 million to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to help speed up the recovery of federally protected threatened and endangered species. 
Um, so here is the link is on the screen. And again, it will be sent out tomorrow. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Kiran to say some final words and close us out. Yeah, well, I want to uh, thank everyone for coming on and um, listening, but you know, most importantly for caring um, because we just can't get all this work done without your without your support and without people who who care who care deeply. And so, um, you know, please do continue signing those petitions and action alerts and making phone calls uh, when we send them out because um, they do make a difference. Um, they help. To help do this. Um, and I also want to thank our, you know, other panelists here. Um, you know, the center has this uh, amazing staff. We've now got about uh, 180 um, scientists, lawyers, activists, communication specialists, um, legislative lobbyists, uh, who are just remarkable, just really a remarkable crew of people who have been uh, spectacularly effective and really are, are the front line for all of these species behind me. By the way, these species, this is a new endangered species stamp group that'll be coming out next month by the US Postal Service to, to, to get these. Um, but the staff are, I mean, they're just amazing people. Um, and there's really very few people other than them standing between these species and extinction. And they do a remarkable job. I've been at this now for almost 34, 34 years. Um, and when I started off doing this, I kind of make it up as I went along. Um, I'm neither a scientist nor a um, lawyer, more of a rabble rouser. Um, but it's just amazing to me to um, see the likes of you know, lawyers like Catherine Kilduff here working on the ocean and, and Lorian Bird on environmental health. And Noah uh, is an amazing scientist, one of uh, many at the um, center, Amaruk. More like me, a general rabble rouser, troublemaker, is a role for us too. Uh, and Stephanie, who's willing to uh, do this hard lobbying legislative work in DC. It's a very tough world to work in. It's full of compromise, full of having to talk to people who really don't like. Uh, it's a very tough job. Uh, there's a reason I don't live in DC, and I'm very thankful Stephanie and, and her crew are willing to spend their time there doing that kind of tough, tough work. And so in closing, you know, thank all of you and uh, stay with us. Um, become members if you haven't already. A lot of our supporters aren't members. There is a link in the chat you can click on to become a member of the center. Um, and we will see you next time. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.